Wow, I don't quite know how to follow that. That was quite amazing. Um, so, I think the best thing I can do is give you 18 minutes of pictures of dead things. Um, okay, right, so, um, yeah, this is me, and um, just thank at the bottom the people that have, uh, that have funded us. We're funded by Me in Scotland, Deaf, and those of you that are from Me in Scotland, Deaf, in the audience, this is what we've done with your money. Um, 2018 was quite an amazing year. We had more strandings than at any point um, in the 25-year history of the, uh, the project. This is just the last 15 years. And you can see that they're increasing year on year. It's roughly split between rotations and, uh, and seals. Um, very few marine turtles, very few basking sharks. And the reason for this is, is multiple. What we want to know is, is this because there's a big mortality incident going on out there, are more animals dying? Or is it the case that there's more animals out there, or simply that we're just getting better at looking for the carcasses that are out there? And it's a bit of everything, actually, and I'll show you why we think that. So I'm going to go through a few case studies that we had. And um, at the forum last year, when we finished the forum and kind of uh, emerged blinking into the sunlight, we headed off to the Isle of Mull because there was this uh, um, longfin pilot whale that was stranded on Calgary Beach. Um, and uh, we were able to, uh, to do the neck a couple of days later and found that this was a, a male animal. It had live stranded, it had come onto a very soft sand beach as you can see and it had died really quite quickly before any rescue response could be, could be mounted. And when we did the post-mortem on it we found that um, basically though the animal was in, in um, not brilliant condition and as you can see at the top here it had, it had managed to in both inhale and swallow quite a lot of water during the process of the stranding. Um, it was, um, generally speaking, just exhibiting age-related changes. This is a picture of the brain, which is a nice thing first in the morning, and the amount of white matter in there gives you an indication that this animal is quite old. It had some bronchial pneumonia, but essentially no other infectious process that was going on in there. But it is worth pointing out that what we did find was that there was quite a lot of necrosis of the skeletal muscle, um, of the, uh, particularly on the belly. And for those of you that are going to Dan and Mark's talk this afternoon, they're going to explain in a lot more detail why that's important because the prognosis for animals that have these sorts of pathology changes when they go back out again is much more guarded so we were able to understand a bit more about what goes on in, in these timing processes. Um, spin forward a month or so and this rather beautiful animal stranded out on the uh, on Hoy, a white big dolphin and uh, she was a female animal that was actually pregnant unfortunately and found dead stranded. Um, Initially, there was foam seen out in blowhole, and that's of significance because um, that can be an indication of bycatch, um, and something that we wanted to, to investigate in more detail. And she was in pretty poor body condition. You can see there, there's not very much by way of blood of there. And this is the foam. But again, for those that haven't spent a lot of time looking at cetacean lungs, foam in airway is not good news. Um, particularly, um, uh, in, in the case of animals where they're suspected bycatch. However, this was not the reason that she stranded. This is it. This is again a picture of the brain and your pathology guide 101 to neuroanatomy is big holes in the brain are bad news. Um, this had a very severe generalized meningitis and Nick managed to pull Brucella seti from the brain and most of the other parts of the CNS system. Um, and we were able to diagnose neurobrucellosis as the cause of death in this, this case. This is a bacterial disease and it's arguably now the most important bacterial pathogen that we see in cetaceans. I've just checked with Nick and there's uh, 10 animal, 10 species rather, that we've isolated this from in terms of pelagic dolphinids. So it's something to watch both in terms of the effect this is having on the population but also because it's potentially zoonotic, the effect that has on those that are involved in the rescue operations. Um, changing genera now onto, onto a seal. This rather lovely animal, um, harp seals, this came into Sky um, in, in May. Um, a very young animal. This is well out of the range for this species. As you know, they're, they're not normally seen around Scotland. These are just vagrant animals. A very thin, very dehydrated. Um, and we found this in the stomach, this little bit of plastic, not much bigger than a sweet wrapper. Now, we were obviously very concerned about that and looked at it in quite some detail and couldn't find actually any evidence that this had been causing a problem. Um, it wasn't stuck, it didn't seem to be um, causing obstruction. Now, we, we've talked about this a lot before. 
plastic pollution is a big issue. We don't see it much in terms of the problems of cetaceans and seals, but it is a good indication here that you do have the sort of the, the prevalence of this. We've also done a study this year looking at microplastics, what happens when things like this get broken down, and found that 100% of the cases that we looked at showed evidence of some microplastics ingested in them. So just to highlight that the, the, this, is, this is very much an issue and worth dealing with. And then we scale it up a little bit. This came in on uh, uh, Budden Ness in Angus in the end of March. This, this sperm whale stranded on, the, on this very shallow estuarine environment. An adult male that we worked out, we didn't have scales to, that would weigh that amount. We reckon it's about 25 tonnes. 25 tonnes because it was in really good body condition. Um, it had a good blubber layer, it had recently eaten fish and squid, and as a result of that, it was kind of pretty hard to shift. Uh, it needed three of these things to be able to move it onto the, the, the upper beach where it was able to do a post-mortem. And uh, this slightly brutal photo here is, is an example of how you can take brain tissue from the sperm whale. You need one of them, and you need a person that doesn't mind standing knee-deep in blood and guts whilst you reach into the back of the brain and take a certain sample of brain. Now the reason for that was that we wanted to see whether or not there was any brucellosis in there and also any other disease. And we were able, because we were able to do quite a, quite a comprehensive post-mortem on this, that there was no infectious process going on there, no plastic ingestion, no entanglement. The reason this animal was stranded was because it had essentially made a navigational error most likely and come into a very shallow tidal area. The tide had gone out and an animal that weighs 25 tonnes doesn't do very well when it's no longer boiled. And then finally, swimming forward to the New Year's Eve, when most people in Scotland were going out and thinking about um, um, having a weed run, and these crazy people from HWDT um, were busy dealing with this, a cubious beach well that had come onto Calvary Beach, and um, they, this had again live stranded and, and died relatively soon, they, they recovered it. Um, I should just say that other beaches are available in Scotland. <laughs> this, uh, happens that we, we have a time. Um, this is an adult male. It was in really poor body condition. It lied stranded in water, uh, in its, uh, inhaled water like the pilot whale had done. Um, but when we opened it up, we found that there was this. This, this, is, this is the fluid in the abdomen, horrible, turbid, quite an infectious looking fluid. Um, it had a chronic arteritis. The reason for that was because of this. this uh, the arteries, These are, this is actually the renal artery, they should be nice and flexible like kind of latex hosing. This was like plumbing pipe, it was incredibly solid and the reason for that was because of these boys. These are a nematode called Crassicorda that sits in the renal arteries, the head buried in the kidneys, the tail end um, elsewhere in the body and it would cause this rip-roaring verminous arteritis as a cause of death. Now, it's kind of interesting in this case to be able to, uh, to establish an infectious cause of death for these animals. But beaked whales have been sort of the theme of this year. And I'm just going to finish off by talking a little bit about the, the unusual mortality event that we've had in the Northeast Atlantic since, um, since August time. So these are the number of beaked whales that we normally get in uh, in a year in Scotland. We get between about four and five of these animals. Uh, we had a small peak in 2008 that of, a, of about 14 or 15 animals that came in that Sarah Dolman um, investigated and wrote up. We had another smaller peak in 14 and 15, but this is this year. We had 107 animals who reported dead stranded on the Atlantic seaboard coast in Ireland and coming up in, into Scotland. Most of these were cubist beaked whales that came in in August and September, but we also found that there were smaller clusters of northern bottlenose whales that came in, for example, into northern Scotland and Orkney. And um, we're also elsewhere. I've, I've, we've got uh, Marie and Tom here who were doing some work in, in Iceland. They were looking at unusual mortality events of, of, of animals that came in around Iceland and also in the Faroes. So you can, this is just a sort of map here showing the, the, the surroundings and the, the colours represent the different species. And then this while well, the lurid chart over here shows where they came in. And you can see that in August they started off having most cases in Ireland around here, which were cubias beaked whales, and then as you moved into September, they were mainly cubias um, and a couple of sort of northern bottlenose whales that kind of stranded in around here. And so they started here, they moved up into this part of the coastline, and then gradually by the time we got up into the Western Isles, 
the, the cases in, that were coming in in September, October, these were pretty skeletal. They were kind of just, just skeletons with a bit of, of, of tissue hanging off them. Um, and at the same time, there were cases that were seen um, in Iceland around here and ones that came in in October in, in Shetland. So we basically got a distribution there. The strandings over five different countries and many, many thousands of miles of coastline. And most of these cases were pretty decomposed. This is one from Iceland, this one from Western Isles. That rather, um, uh, there's not much you can do with that, I thought. So, um, and also there were some animals that were observed that were alive. Now these were behaving in, in slightly strange fashions. They were milling, they were tail slapping, they were doing behaviors, and they were in areas of the, of the ocean that were not, not normally associated with these very deep diving species. But the problem we had is that there's a very limited amount of pathological information that you can do. Basically, how do you investigate this when you don't really have a body to work with? And the way that we, we did this, and when I say we did this, it's been a big effort with lots of different people from a lot of different organizations, um, most of uh, whom are represented in the room today, um, for how you, how you look at these sort of mortality events. So the first question is, is this unusual? Well, yes, it is. I mean, the graph speaks for itself, really. To put it a different way, we had more cases in August um, in Scotland than we had done in the entire previous 10 years put together. It is now the largest global mortality event of deep wells that has ever been recorded. Um, and this is the split of where the cases have come in. The question for that is, is that because there were more animals out there? Was the Eastern Atlantic the place to be if you were a beaked whale in 2018? And from the data that, we, that you guys have helped collect from the Sea Watch, Shore Watch, the HWDC Whale Track app, other people who are out there doing sightings, that does not seem to be the case. It doesn't seem like there was a large, an increase in the number of animals that were out there. And therefore, is it simply that there's some better carcass reporting? Are we better at noticing things on the beach and letting people know about that? Well, I think in Scotland there is that, that case. I mean, those of you that are our volunteers, um, you've, been, you've done an amazing job of going out and looking for these cases. Some people, you know, Mary's here, have actually found more than one of these animals from going out and wandering on beaches of, of Scotland. Um, so we think there is an increase of effort. But there wasn't a, a really meteorological event that was scouring the Eastern Atlantic and dumping these cases onto the, onto the beach. So there was something going on there. So we did what we could, and the question was, is, is there any evidence of the infectious or toxic um, cause that we can find? And if you, you see the pattern of the strandings, they're very close together. They're, they don't fit what we'd expect to see in an epidemic or epizootic. You didn't have any sick animals coming in. You didn't have any thin animals that were coming in. We started off with a large number of animals that came in in, in poor body, in, in, in decomposed condition, and then they ended up coming in in even more skeletal condition. So it doesn't fit with, with it being an infectious or, 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 or toxic cause. Um, we did have a screen for mobilivirus. Mobilivirus is related to rinderpest and measles, and it's a, it's a common cause of, of mortality and cetaceans and we looked in the tissues that we were able to get um, and found that they were all negative for that. So we think we're pretty confident there isn't a, a, a viral cause to this. And then there's a question, is, is there any evidence of other trauma? Well, there wasn't much skeletal trauma we could find. George amazingly collected most of these animals and, and, and stripped them down and didn't find much by way of, of, of bone trauma. But we did find this. So this is the acoustic fact that in, in the jaw of these, these animals and uh, you can see there's a difference in, in, in this one, there's obvious hemorrhage there. Now, that's potentially significant because that can be as a result of some, uh, some form of traumatic incident, acoustic or, or physical, that's happened to these animals whilst they're at sea. And we also have a small amount of evidence here, potentially these, so this is lung tissue, quite decomposed lung tissue, these little bits are stained with fat. Now this might mean that what we're seeing here are fat emboli, and that's kind of significant because if you get this and you get that, that's very, very indicative of exposure to decompression sickness. Where animals have essentially come up to the surface a little bit too quickly and have succumbed to the effect of the bends. And the one thing that we know, particularly with cubic speed wells, that is the most common reason for doing this is naval sonar. This, particularly this mid-range sonar which is used by um, naval vessels hunting submarines. It just, it's between one and 10 kilohertz, and it seems to be 
very, very good if you want to find a, a for example, a Russian submarine wandering around the trench off the west of Scotland. Uh, but it is also the frequencies that these animals use to feed and forage. So the, there's, a, there's a, a large amount of evidence that this is, this is potentially a problem with Cupid's beef soils in the past. So we went and asked to see, well, where could this noise come from? No earthquakes, nothing by way of seismic. And we asked the Navy and said, um, were you out there and did you do anything? And they replied to us somewhat unhelpfully saying, we were out there, but we're not telling you what we were doing. Um, so it's, uh, it's going to be difficult to get to the bottom of this. The pathology is, not, is, is, is very circumspect. We don't have anything, um, no literal acoustic smoking guns from this, but we do have some evidence. And we think now this is the most plausible reason for these animals um, were stranded. So what we were looking at was, well, if you're going to tell us where you were, let's see if we can tell from the carcasses where you were. So this is work that was done by Andy Dale at Sands, and what he's done is he's essentially seeded a load of virtual whales uh, carcasses into the Atlantic and then applied drift modeling, of what we know about how carcasses move, the influence of wind and tide um, on them, and seeing where they could potentially be. And this, this one from the cluster, uh, from the uh, this is the uh, porcupine sea by here. You can see they kind of hit island, but they miss everything else. So if you rerun the model with a slightly bigger area, a bit further north, you get something that's a little bit more plausible. So you start getting cases that come into Ireland, and then they come into Western Scotland and the Western Isles, and you even potentially get the odd one that kind of makes its way around and heads towards the Northern Isles. So this is a lot more plausible. This is potentially where we are. We're now looking that there's some activity. So this is the shelf edge here. This is potentially where there was something going on, probably at the beginning of, of, uh, of uh, August. Um, so this is a work in progress. He's running these data with, uh, hopefully with the Iceland data in that as well. But it does show that there, is, there are things that we can do, even if all we have on, on to deal with is just a few um, bones on a beach. So that's basically it. Um, yeah, close to time. So basically, we had more strandings in 2018 than any point we've had before. And the, the data that we've got from that has helped us sort of fit together what's going on um, with, these, with these individuals and then also by inference the population and highlight some important factors which are, you know, can be both natural and man made, um, such as the such as brucella, sort of vernus arteritis and also the effect of naval sonar, which impact the health of the marine life around, around our ocean. But also, importantly, it helps us under identify those strandings which are just bad luck. They're just part of the natural process. They're not, you know, it's just every animal that ends up on the beach is not there because of something that we have done. Um, some of them are there. Um, and the point is that the, the only way that we can do this is because of the countless number of people who give up their time to add a little bit of piece of this jigsaw. Um, so basically on behalf of, of SMAS and, and the others who work on, on this sort of crazy job, um, I'd like to thank you all very, very much indeed. And um, we hope you enjoy the rest of your forum.